it's Michelle Maxim and I'm an HIV and infectious diseases pharmacist and today I'll be reviewing with you HIV treatment and what to start in patients that are newly diagnosed with HIV that may be coming through your ED. By the end of my presentation I hope that you understand the importance of rapid initiation of HIV treatment, be able to briefly review appropriate pretreatment labs and considerations for HIV treatment, review mechanisms of action and common side effects of first-line antiretroviral regimens for HIV, and be able to design the HIV regimen for treatment-naive patients. So similar to other medications, there are always going to be advantages and disadvantages to starting antiretroviral therapy. Some of the advantages would be to boost the patient's immune system, improve their quality of life, and extend their life expectancy. On the flip side, if you are going to delay treatment or choose to not start treatment at that time, you can increase transmission rates, increase AIDS-related complications, or increase morbidity and mortality as it relates to HIV and AIDS. Now, to take a step back and to truly appreciate how far we've come with antiretroviral treatment and HIV care, we have to understand that it was 35 years ago that the FDA approved its first antiretroviral zidovudine, which is an NRTI, for the treatment of HIV. About seven years later, the first protease inhibitor was, dis was approved by the FDA, followed by the first NNRTI that was approved the following year. And then also that same year, highly active antiretroviral therapy became the mainstay of treatment in the United States. Now, HEART was a game changer for us simply because it not only decreased transmissions or new diagnoses, but also significantly decreased deaths in the United States. And those continued to decrease over the years, especially once integrase inhibitors became really the mainstay of therapy, um, you know, shortly thereafter. Now, unfortunately, rates are still affecting certain patient populations disproportionately. In 2019, there were almost 37,000 new HIV diagnoses, and of those 37,000, the majority of those were Black or African-American men or Hispanic or Latino men who have sex with men. In addition to the two populations that I mentioned, other patients that had higher incidences or rates of new diagnoses of HIV included persons who inject drugs, high-risk heterosexuals, as well as transgender individuals. In addition to these populations, there are also various hot spots or high risk, high rates of HIV in counties across the country. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services identified this and determined this was a public health crisis and wanted to ultimately reduce the number of new diagnoses of HIV by 75% within five years and by 90% within 10 years. They determined four different strategies to reach this goal, which was to diagnose HIV as soon as possible, treat HIV as quickly as possible, prevent HIV in high-risk patients, and detect new clusters to reduce transmission. And as pharmacists, I will now focus my presentation on treating HIV as quickly as possible. When thinking about rapid initiation, there's two trials that stick out in terms of why it's important to rapidly start a patient on HIV treatment. The first trial is the START trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015, and it looked at starting patients on treatment immediately versus delaying therapy until a patient CD4 was at least 350. Patients that had immediate start had less serious age-related events, including death from AIDS or any AIDS-defining event, and also had less serious age-related illnesses compared to those patients that had deferred treatment. Patients that had a immediate initiation had a shorter time to love viral loads less than or equal to 200 copies and had a higher, quicker response to a, a rebound in their CD4 count. Um, and if you realize this CD4 count and these viral loads never tended to go as high as an immediate initiation as they did in the deferred initiation over time. The Temprano study was the second study that was also published in the New England Journal in 2015 and showed similar results as the START trial. So this trial looked at early ART versus deferred ART defined by the WHO guidelines at that time. And in patients that had early antiretroviral therapy, there was decreased amount of deaths and severe AIDS-related illnesses, as well as adverse events. In patients that had a CD4 count, 
less than 500, there was also a decrease in death or severe AIDS-related events that was statistically significant. So while we understand now that rapidly starting HIV treatment significantly reduces age-related death, age-related severe illnesses, age-related or even HIV-related adverse events when it comes to the medications. There's also something to consider in those patients that have a lower CD4 count and over time what that could look like in patients that go on to develop drug resistance. So this is a much older study that was published in 2009 that looked at about 760 HIV patients and in those patients that had failed treatment what that failure looked like when they evaluated CD4 cutoffs and it showed that the in 50% of the failures, their CD4 count was less than 349, compared to patients that had a CD4 count above 350 and them failing at a 22% rate. And as you can see, the highest amount of failure rates included those patients that had a CD4, like I said, between 0 and 199, or really 200 and 349. Now, of course, there are exceptions to every rule. Uh, so there are situations, so in patients that have certain opportunistic infections, such as cryptococcal meningitis or TB meningitis, it's actually important to delay antiretroviral therapy. And that is because you want to reduce the risk of the patient dying. In cryptococcal meningitis, you don't necessarily have to consider, or you don't consider CD4 cutoffs, but you do consider starting treatment or start treatment four to six weeks after fungal therapy. If you ha patient has TB meningitis and their CD4 count is less than 50, it is recommended that you start antiretroviral therapy two to eight weeks after you start TB treatment. So let's say you have a patient that comes into your ED and they were newly diagnosed with HIV maybe last week and they haven't started treatment. There are a lot of things that as the pharmacist you should consider prior to starting that patient on treatment or recommending an antiretroviral regimen for them. Some of the more obvious things that you should consider are side effects, drug interactions, renal function, um, their willingness to start treatment, but there's so many other things that should be in in your mind as far as what you should be considering, including does my current ED or my current health system have an HIV or ID clinic? And if so, can, um, or if not, can my ED providers put in a referral so that the patient can be linked to care? Other things that a patient, that we should consider as pharmacists are appointments. Can a patient keep the appointment? Can they make their appointments? Are they in-person, virtual? What type of insurance do they have? What insurance covers for their antiretroviral treatments? And then do they have the ability to go to a Ryan White clinic? Is ADAP available for the patient? And then beyond that is, will the patient be able to adhere to the medication 100%? You kind of start to think about some other things in addition to what I mentioned before. Also, pill burden, which may not be as much of a factor now because you have so many one, one tablet once a day regimens, but also what barriers to adherence should you be able to identify prior to them starting on treatment and can you work through those things before the patient gets started on treatment. Once a patient is diagnosed with HIV using the likely using the HIV antibody antigen test, it's important to get a viral load um, to determine which antiretroviral regimens you can start a patient on. The majority of the regimens that are recommended by the DHHS guidelines don't have a viral load cutoff, but there is one particular regimen that you do need a cutoff for, and it's good to have a baseline to help patients understand their new diagnosis. The next lab that you should definitely get is a CD4 count. Um, there is certain CD4 counts that you should start prophylaxis in, especially if patients are not going to go on treatment immediately. Um, and I'll kind of discuss that a little later. The HLA B5701 test is important, especially if we're going to start a patient on a Bacavir, which would be a part of the Ditegravir, Bacavir, Lamivudine, one tablet once a day regimen. 
If a patient's HLA-B5701 test comes back positive, it's important to not start them on treatment. They are at risk for developing severe hypersensitivity reactions, and if re-challenged, patients that have this um, allele can actually it can actually be life-threatening if they were to take a bacavir. So very important to have that result back before you initiate that regimen. So along the lines of the CD4 counts, you want to test for G6PD deficiency. This is an enzyme, and if you are deficient in this enzyme, you should not take Dapsone. Other things that you should get is a genotype, hepatitis B serologies, and a BMP. The genotype generally will help assist the provider in determining if you if the patient has any baseline mutations. Hepatitis B serologies will help with determining which regimens you should put the patient on if they have hepatitis B, and then a BMP would help with determining creatinine clearance if there were specific cutoffs that you need to keep in mind. I've listed the other pretreatment labs for your reference as recommended by the DHHS guidelines. Now I'd like to review some of the most common antiretroviral classes, so the first I will start with are the nucleoside or nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors, or NRTIs. The most common NRTIs that you would see in an antiretroviral regimen are going to be tenofovir alafenamide, which is the newer salt formulation, tenofovir disoproxyl, which is the older salt formulation, emtricitabine, lamivudine, and abacavir. So I already mentioned the hypersensitivity reactions that are related to abacavir. This class in general is pretty well tolerated in terms of headaches and GI upset. Um, with the tenofovir disoproxyl specifically, there has been reported more um, renal damage or dysfunction or bone mineral density changes. I'll explain that a little later as to why. The next class of drugs are the non-nukes or the NNRTIs. The most common NNRTI is the newest generation NNRTI ropivirine. Um, your most common side effects are going to be, um, again, nausea, headache, maybe some hyperlipidemia. Those neuropsychiatric events are mainly related to favorins, which is no longer a part of the um, first-line treatment for HIV. Your next class of drugs is your protease inhibitors. Um, darunavir is seen more commonly or started more commonly, and these are definitely going to be more of your um, hyperlipidemia, hyperbilirubinemia. Could also cause rash, so it's important for patients to be aware of monitoring that and helping you know providers monitor that. Um, fat maldistribution is also something that was more common in the older generation protease inhibitors, and in fact, there was medications that were actually designed to target fat maldistribution or lipodystrophy caused by protease inhibitors. One common one that I know of is eGrifta. Um, however, um, you don't really see much of that fat maldistribution with the newer generation protease inhibitors. This regimen, or excuse me, this class of drugs always requires a boosting agent. So whether it's ritonavir, which was an older antiretroviral, or copisostat, which is not an antiretroviral at all, and it only uses it's only used for the boosting properties. Um, so it's important to know that this will always come with a boosting agent, and therefore drug interactions. The next class of drugs is your integrase inhibitors. Um, the most common integrase inhibitors are Bictegravir and Dolutegravir. These are becoming the most common because Elvitegravir and Raltegravir have lower barriers to resistance. And so for the first line regimens, um, Bictegravir and Dolutegravir, you will see repeated quite often. Another reason why these are popular is not only because they're extremely effective, so a lot of the studies showed that um, Dolutegravir, Bictegravir-based regimens drop their drop viral loads to um, undetectable levels within one month in the majority of patients taking the regimen. Um, so it's effective, but it's also very well tolerated. So the most common side effects are going to be some type of GI upset, headaches, and there is some discussion about weight gain, and I'll kind of go through some studies that um, touch on that as well. So in thinking about first-line regimens, it's always important to go to the DHHS guidelines to see what is new. Those guidelines are recommended, or excuse me, are updated 
very frequently compared to some of the IDSA guidelines that um, are published. And so it's really important to always be in the know is to definitely use that as a reference. So when making this presentation, there are essentially integrase inhibitor based regimens that are going to be recommended for treatment naive patients. I've also included a protease inhibitor based regimen in case a patient cannot take integrase inhibitors. Uh, so first you will see Bictegravir, Emtricitabine, Tenofovir, Alafenamide, that is Bictarvi, um, a one tablet once a day regimen. You have Ditregravir, Bacavir, Lamivudine, which is Triumec. Again, the HLA B5701 needs to be negative in order for a patient to take this regimen. You also have an option for a two drug regimen, Ditregravir plus Emtricitabine, Tenofovir, Alafenamide, or Ditregravir plus Emtricitabine, Tenofovir, Disaproxyl. There is a two drug regimen that is appropriate for some patients, Ditregravir, Lamivudine. And then again, the protease inhibitor based regimen where you see the boosting agent copecistat in addition to intracytabine to not fear alafenamide. So when choosing of those various regimens, what to start a patient on, it's important to understand and be reminded of how long patients are actually living once they are on HIV treatment. So a person without HIV in the 2010s had a life expectancy of 79 years in the United States. Um, if a patient was diagnosed with HIV at the age of 20 and they stayed on their HIV medications, they could live as long as 71 years. And then patients that did not take HIV treatment, so kind of going back to why it's important to initiate treatment as soon as possible and keep them on treatment, their life expectancy was much shorter. It was even cut in half. Um, so it's important to understand that now that patients are living longer, when you go to choose an antiretroviral regimen, you have to consider drug interactions, you have to consider side effects, you have to consider toxicities. So one of the most common drug interactions that I see in practice is the polyvalent cations and integrase inhibitor drug interaction. I see this often because, again, the majority of patients that I see are on dolutegravir-based regimens or bictegravir-based regimens. And multivitamins are just something that it you know, kind of goes unnoticed um, because a lot of times it doesn't interact with the majority of medications. However, cations will bind to the integrase inhibitors and reduce the concentrations. And it's important to counsel patients whether they're taking multivitamins, whether they're taking antacids, to take the antiretroviral therapy either two hours before or six hours after that multivitamin or antacid to get around that reduction in effectiveness. Again, this is important because Integrase inhibitor-based regimens work so, so well. So if you are unknowingly having an interaction with decre decreases the effectiveness of the drug, um, it's important to be able to identify that so you can avoid drug resistance down the line. Another big point to make with drug interactions is again with protease inhibitors, because you have that boosting agent that's needed, you have to check drug interactions once a medrec is actually complete. So oftentimes, I'm sure as ED pharmacists, you know that once you do a medrec, there's a lot of other medications that may become a part of a patient's current medication list. And that's the point of it, right? It's to correct and to add and to edit, to remove you know, certain medications that a patient may or may not be taking. And so it's always important important once you finish that med rec to then run a drug interaction report to see what a patient would go on. It's also important to understand that patients may go on medications in the future. And so my preference, if I were to choose between an integrase inhibitor based regimen or a protease inhibitor based regimen based on drugs and drug interactions alone, I would likely choose integrase inhibitor based regimens every time simply to reduce the drug interaction piece. So tenofovir alafenamide and tenofovir disaproxyl are the two salt forms that tenofovir has. Tenofovir disaproxyl is an older salt form that essentially had higher concentrations in the blood, which caused various side effects. And so a newer formulation was created to decrease the concentrations of tenofovir in the body. This newer formulation, or alafenamide, reduces bone mineral density changes as well as reduces kidney damage, which was found in the disaproxyl formulation. So you will see that newer regimens will have the alafenamide component in it to help prevent those side effects down the road. Now, in patients that are younger, patients may not need to be on an alafenamide 
regimen. Um, but of course, knowing that they will eventually, um, you know, be older, it's definitely a discussion to have with patients. Um, oftentimes, just as a note, oftentimes bone mineral density scans aren't really done in the ED. Um, so it's important to just ask certain questions, like have you been diagnosed with osteoporosis, osteopenia, um, or something else to consider is if a patient has um, a frequent amount of fractures, bone fractures, um, that aren't related to trauma. Neural tube defects might also come up once you recommend once you start recommending integrase inhibitor based regimens based on a previous study that showed that patients that were in Botswana, pregnant women, there was about 0.9% of patients had neural tube defects after being exposed to dolutegravir. Um, there is an update to this study and it looked at about close to 15,000 patients, and there was actually five patients in the dietegravir arm that had neural tube defects, which is about 0.3%, and essentially showed, compared to 0.1% in those that did not have a dietegravir-based regimen. Um, this showed that, you know, dietegravir-based regimens can be recommended to patients of childbearing potential, and is currently still recommended in pregnant patients if you were to start them on a regimen, but it's important to have that conversation. Um, of note, in Botswana, they had less fortified foods, um, so less amount of food that had folic acid, so you're already evaluating a patient population that had less folic acid compared to um, foods in the United States. Another thing might, that might come up is weight gain in integrase inhibitor-based regimens specifically. And so there have been some studies showing that in patients that start ARVs in general, you may have some weight gain. However, in patients that start integrase inhibitor-based regimens that you see more weight gain. So this study published in CID showed that overall, there was weight gain in all patients um, that started in a retroviral regimen. But when you looked at dietary based regimen specifically, there was up to six kilograms of weight gain in patients 18 months after starting treatment. Now, when taking a look at weight gain by class, overall weight gain or the median weight gain ranged anywhere from losing 0.9 pounds to gaining close to, excuse me, losing less than one kilogram to gaining almost six kilograms. Integrase inhibitors um, had the highest weight gain, which was closer to about seven and a half pounds um, over 96 weeks. The important thing to remember though, is that once a patient starts on an antiretroviral regimen and their viral load becomes undetectable and their CD4 count improves, it's important to understand that these patients have a higher quality of life and improved immune system, and so they ultimately feel better. So it is noted that there is higher weight gain, but important to know that likely patients will begin to gain weight regardless of the regimen that they are taking. So along those lines, there are various risk factors that would put any patient um, at risk for gaining weight when starting any antiretroviral regimen. So your CD4 count, whether you use IV drugs, your race, your viral load, a patient if they are symptomatic, um, so being so catching HIV in that acute phase, uh, their sex, their age, and their BMI, BMI, excuse me, all contribute to a patient potentially having increased weight gain. When patients need renal adjustment, it's important to understand with antiretrovirals that not all components will require adjusting. And so you want to break up the individual components and only adjust the ones that need adjustment, but still give all of them as you would at the same time for the patient. Sometimes the renal adjustments are, or the cutoffs are because the medications just weren't studied in that patient population. Other times there can be concern for toxicity. Um, so initially there was a concern that lamivudine would cause lactic acidosis in those where um, the renal function was lower or impaired, which would lead to a buildup of lamivudine. However, 
newer studies show that there is more concern just for the increase in concentrations and not necessarily lactic acidosis. So the newer studies actually report no episodes of lactic acidosis and only report nausea or GI symptoms. They also looked at various creatinine clearances to see what those particular concentrations were, and I have that listed for you on the slide. Ultimately, to show and say that at certain renal cutoffs, you don't have to renally adjust. So now the new cutoffs are creatinine clearance greater than 30 or 30 and up. You can continue to use lamivudine 300 milligrams daily. Um, if you have a creatinine clearance less than that, then that's when you would renally, adjust, renally dose adjust. And not to say that you should essentially do this and evaluate every single um, and a retrovirals dosing regimen and where it came from, um, because I'm sure you won't have time to do that in the ED, but it's important to know that some of these things can be updated and again, why it's important to visit the DHHS guidelines when you have time. Two drug regimens will likely come up since there is one regimen that is currently recommended by the DHHS guidelines for treatment initiation. However, before 2018, we weren't really we weren't using two drug regimens, and it was due to the increase in treatment failures, the lack of long-term data, and even though there were lower discontinuation rates associated with toxicities, there still were no head-to-head -head trials evaluating which two drug regimen was optimal. It wasn't until dolutegravir-lamivudine was studied in treatment-naive patients. So dolutegravir-lamivudine, or Dovato, was compared to dolutegravir-amtricitabine, TDF, and it showed that in patients that had a viral load, a baseline viral load less than 500,000, that Dovato was not inferior to a three-drug regimen, which was a game-changer for a lot of patients that felt like a lot of their side effects were due to other components of their antiretroviral regimen. So when it comes to making a recommendation or deciding what a patient is going to be discharged on or started on in the ED, it's very important to take into consideration the patient's specific factors. So if a patient is less likely to be adherent on a two-drug two drug regimen, as in two tablets daily versus a single tablet, you might not want to t choose dolutegravir plus emtricitabine tenofovir alafenamide. If you have to consider renal adjustments, it might be ideal to start a patient on dolutegravir, bacavir, lamivudine, trimec, or Devato. Um, now there's been data to support using dialysis or being able to use any of these regimens in dialysis, so that's wonderful. Um, in terms of where it's not recommended, this is likely where you should spend a lot of your time considering what a patient should be on. So if they have a high viral load, you should not, higher than 500,000, you should not be starting dietary lamivudine. Um, if you do not have HLA B5701, then you should not be starting or even thinking about trimec or dietary bacavir lamivudine. Also, if you don't have hepatitis B serologies back, then I would also not consider the two drug regimen. In patients that have creatinine clearance less than 30, um, there are options for the patient such as Triumec or Devato. Um, additionally, it's really important to think about side effect profile. Um, so if you are needing a patient to take something with food or not, if they don't eat, um, then choosing an integrase inhibitor based regimen is ideal. And then if all those things fail, again, I would try to avoid protease inhibitor based regimens because of those drug interactions or future drug interactions. Um, and they have to take something with food or they don't have an issue with taking food in addition to the other things, um, consider a protease inhibitor based regimen. So I would be remiss if I did not bring up or mention opportunistic infection prophylaxis in patients that have a CD4 count less than 200. So there are several opportunistic infections 
over 20 opportunistic infections that a patient could be at risk for once their CD4 count drops below 200. And so just as much as the antibody antigen, just as much as the viral load, and the CD4 count is important to understand how to appropriately send the patient out from the ED. So once a patient's CD4 drops below 200, they are at risk for pneumocystis pneumonia or PCP. And your first line agent would be trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Um, this is an easier regimen to take. It's one tablet once a day in addition to a single tablet regimen that they would likely already be on uh, unless they have a sulfa allergy or have elevated potassium or even hyperkalemia at baseline. Other options for the patient would be Dapsone by itself. Again, making sure that the patient already has a G6PD back. Um, and then Atovaquone as the third agent. Um, this one is less than ideal simply because of the taste. Um, it does not taste very good. And because of the liquid, like the amount of liquid that you have to, a patient has to ingest. Um, and as well as the cost. Um, if a patient CD4 is less than 100, you would want to start them on toxoplasmosis or toxo prevention. So thankfully, um, if a patient CD4 is less than 100, you can use um, trim sulfa for both toxo and PCP. If a patient CD4 is less than 100 and you're concerned for toxo, you also want to add pyrimethamine to the dapsone, or you could also use a tovacone by itself. Um, and then if you have a CD4 less than 50, previously, if you were not putting a patient, well, previously, you would start patients on weekly azithromycin. However, new, or not new anymore, but um, there were some studies published um, in the last about 10 years that showed that, or maybe 15 years at this point, but showed that with a CD4 count less than 50, and if your viral load is less than 1,000, the likelihood of you getting MAC was extremely low, extremely rare. And so if the patient is definitively going to start antiretroviral therapy, based on one of the regimens that I discussed earlier, you do not have to start patients on MAC prophylaxis. Um, this is not necessarily the case with the other opportunistic infections, um, so that's an important point to make, um, but it is important to understand that if you are concerned for MAC, so there are a lot of patients that I've seen in the hospital with the CD4 count of one, two, and they're not prepared to start antiretrovirals, I would put them on azithromycin plus Bactrim. Although I would love for every single pharmacist that watches this presentation to all of a sudden fall in love with HIV and to be HIV experts, I know that's not the reality, um, but I will say though that there are excellent resources out there, not only for patients, but also for pharmacists and other providers. As I mentioned before, the DHHS guidelines are a wealth of knowledge, HIVinfo.gov, it was previously AIDSinfo.gov, and it has everything from what to do in every scenario that you can ever come up with to opportunistic infections to what to start in a pregnant patient to what to give to a neonate, um, all of the resources at your fingertips. IAS, or the International Antiviral Society, actually has a separate guideline um, that generally falls along the lines with the DHS guidelines, um, but it's important to also take a look there. They're not as interactive, and it's actually just published as a PDF. Um, so it's important to know that those are aware. They also offer podcasts, webinars, and presentations where you can get CE credit. ADAP and Ryan White are excellent resources um, that allows patients to get HIV treatment if they are uninsured or underinsured, and you can get HIV-related care, such as visits, um, covered through these programs. Most importantly, or last but not least, I should mention the Do Not Crush list. This comes up almost all the time in the hospitals. Uh, it's important to have this 
on your phone if you need it. You can save it as a bookmark on your phone, um, but it's really important to have the Do Not Crush list just so you know what medications have been studied or what formulations are available in liquids that you can put together um, for a treatment regimen. This concludes my presentation. I hope that you guys were able to learn a few things about treatment initiation and what to do in the ED if you were to have a patient that was newly diagnosed with HIV. So thank you for listening and have a great day.